fresh meat is brought into uh, mm. Great, that's a great question. I anticipate that uh, you'll see a diversification of the E. coli that's colonizing people. Um, you'll see a lot more drug-resistant salmonella and Campylobacter infections. And, um, and, the, and the diversification of the, the E. coli will be reflected in um, a more diverse pool that are causing urinary tract infections and more drug resistance. Yeah, so drug resistance will blow up as well as the diversity. So why do you think current you know, the current association between um, antibiotic res resistant bugs in animals and in humans is the important question in terms of predicting the future. I and mean, isn't it reasonable to, rather than thinking it's going to be on some easy, easy curve, don't you think there could be some very different sort of cataclysmic change? Uh, could you I do think we're heading for a cataclysmic change. Well, that's what I wonder. You're sort of suggest saying that, the, you know, we really have to understand the current relationship, or, right. and we don't know what the numbers are and how much current anti antibiotic resistance comes from. But you could model this a lot of different ways, and there could be different strains that re result in very different sort of changes. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. We, we got slapped in the face with this just recently with, um, when we found out that Chinese livestock producers were using our last drug for treating one of the most resistant bacteria, carbapenemersis and bacteria in you know, millions of tons, millions of pounds of antibiotics, sorry, millions of pounds of tons of antibiotics in their livestock production there. And that's where we saw the first, first saw the evolution of this uh, resistance, highly promiscuous um, resistance element that uh, in E. coli, that jumps from E. coli strain to E. coli strains among plasmids. It's, it's promiscuous on so many different levels. E. coli itself is promiscuous. The plasmids are promiscuous in the gene is. And that clearly came from animal production and now it's spreading around the world. And that's the last card for a raw flush for these bacteria. And so, um, yeah, you can have this cataclysmic um, you know, contribution. So let's say that all of the resistance in those, those CREs, this is just for example, I mean, I don't think it's actually true. All of the resistance elements evolved in human medicine. And then they get this last, this last piece from animals and a million people are killed. Do you, do you count one of those is from animal production or a, you know 900 you know whatever it's it's a it's a tough challenge and so I think it comes back to this idea that we even though I do this because it's sort of a hobby we should really just stop using antibiotics except when they're absolutely necessary but we see zero evidence that that's going to happen yeah so we know that there's a very broad population of microorganisms in the intestinal tract. How much genetic transfer is there from E. coli to other organisms, particularly pathogens, and the other way? Is, is there much movement between them? Uh, you know, the, the old historic, or the old studies that Dr. Levy did, Levy at uh, TOPS, I mean, they showed that there, there's quite a bit of genetic exchange. Um, but I don't know on an individual basis what the probability is that an exchange will take place. But most of what we deal with in the world of antimicrobial resistance has to do with very, very rare events, actually. So if you, that SC131, uh, that the really epidemic clone, the big gold cluster at the top of that tree that's resistant to all but two antibiotics, um, we showed with our, with our evolutionary studies that it picked up one, it only picked up the ESBL resistance gene, which is on a mobile element, once. And that led to this massive clonal expansion and pandemic spread. And so, um, you know, previously using sort of the older methods where you have recombination was sort of masking the, the real natural history of this. So they were using PFGE, which pulse field gel electrophoresis, which we used for, for years for uh, foodborne outbreak investigations. By PFGE, it looked like SC131 had picked up this, this mobile element many, many times in its life history, and that each of those was causing problems. We showed very clearly that it picked it up once and then blew up. And so, you know, I, I, it, it's clear that it happens. I don't know how frequent that exchange happens, but it probably doesn't matter too much because when you have 9 billion animals and in, in the United States alone, the rare events become 
Uh, you've had a question. Uh, well, I'm letting you have the opportunity to ask mine. <laughs> uh, great talk, by the way. Um, so, every, and every time I hear you talk, I'm that much more re, re energized to make sure I'm buying antibiotic free, you know, uh, uh, chicken and eggs, and you're probably going to tell me that that's, that's just a marketing ploy. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I, I, I do the same thing. <laughs> Um, I like to throw my money away too. <laughs> Just kidding. Has, has it, in, uh, obviously, a lot of work to be done, but has it improved, say, over the last 10 years or so, where there has been a reduction in antibiotic use? Well, and I'll let you take a little credit for that. Dr. Lacuma, <laughs> thank you for asking that. Uh, so, in 2012, I started at GW. Uh, in 2012, I, I'd already been working with Putrid Old Trust for several years on this issue with Laura Rogers, who's my deputy director in the center. And um, that year, Laura started a public facing campaign on um, really targeting poultry and antibiotic use in poultry. And uh, at, in 2012, less than 4% of poultry products in the United States were raised without antibiotics. Today, it's more than 40%. So, in a very quick uh, Turnaround. We've we've switched the industry. We've really pushed the industry, and they say that's due to consumer demand. Now, in a in a developed country, <laughs> sorry, uh, in a different style country, sorry, I should say that you know <coughs> logical policies could be put in place where you say, hey, this is a public good. Um, you know, you're you're endangering it. We don't have all the proof. We don't have all the data, but we're not going to let you feed it to animals to make them grow faster anymore. And that happens you know, in places like Denmark, but here it doesn't. But so you work within the system you're in, and market-based uh, strategies work here. And, and so by informing the consumer and uh, giving them a platform to speak, um, they change the industry. Do we know Malia. anything about um, antibiotic resistance in the developing world? I'm thinking of shrimp. You know, yeah. shrimp are raised with huge concentrations yeah. of antibiotics. Do you know anything about their microflora? I don't. Yeah, yeah. We've started to look. Um, we've started to look at them, and and the problem is that they have different uh, aromonas and other sort of water mm -hmm. water bugs. You also get uh, not water bugs. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you also have human contamination of the environment too, right? So you have human waste going in there. You then have the drugs that are <coughs> added directly, and so it's it's a seems like a recipe for disaster. But not enough research has been done there. Uh, Maya has been doing some work, our colleague in Vietnam, and, and they saw really really resistant bacteria in the shrimp farm, and chickens, and in people. So <coughs> with these markers and with your Iceland study. Where do you, what's your vision? Where do you hope to go with it? All right, so uh, I guess I should stop talking after this. Um, I think in Iceland we can answer some really important questions. Like start to quantify how often, in a developed world context, how often do um, bacteria move from food animals into people or spill over anyway? Um, what, is the, what is the impact of international trade agreements? You know, what, what can happen with the importation from other countries? Eventually, we want to look at trade, so, or sorry, travel, too. So how, when you travel for, on vacation and come home, what do you come col home colonized with and what do you share? When they have two and a half million people coming to the country, what are they bringing in and how often do those spread? And, and so I think we can learn a lot there. Um, and then, I think once we have, once we cut our teeth there, I think we can start to, overlay the challenges, right? So we can go to a place like Taiwan or some of the island countries that we've studied in the past, you know, like Jamaica and, and um, Haiti and other places where you have uh, really, really resistant bacteria, but also lots of chaos and big populations. And, um, you know, we saw neonatal infections. The kids were dying of, of in the hospital. I mean, this is, I, I can't even talk about it now that I have a baby, but I mean, it's just like, Amazing, these kids are, are, are dying of these drug resistant bacteria. Yeah, simple infections. And also, I think one of the biggest things that you talk about um, is how, you know, uh, a lot of cancer patients or a lot of elderly patients, they die of, uh, they die of a different disease, but really they're dying of infection, right? Right, yeah, so, so last point to make, I guess, is that um, when you hear about 
uh, well, can't, let's just, we don't have to go past cancer, right? So people die, you hear people die of cancer all the time, right? And everybody recognizes that they've lost somebody to cancer. And, but one in eight, one in 10 cancer patients die of bacterial infections because their immune systems are shot. And, but when it's coded, you can only die of one thing. So they don't say you died of a bacterial infection, they say you died of cancer. And so our, people don't recognize how close they are to this problem and how close we are to, to you know, the brink of, of really bad times. So, uh, to leave you on a positive <laughs>